Today, I want to talk about the power of nomological machines, as you see. Um, and I, um, some of you weren't here last time. At any rate, it's always good to review. Um, and um, when I started my career in philosophy, uh, I think I mentioned that it was at a time when you really couldn't talk about causality. Uh, the uh, positivism in philosophy uh, was um, at its height, and um, causality was very, very much out of style, whereas right now it's very much in style. And um, so I felt very brave when I first started writing in defense of the need to use causal language and causal concepts in science. Um, and this is from uh, my first paper on the subject. Um, and the paper started with this quote. Um, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be, simply wouldn't be true to say, Nancy L.D. Cartwright, if you own a Thai Cref, oh, a Thai life insurance policy, you'll live longer. But it is a fact, nonetheless, that persons insured by Thai do enjoy longer lifetimes, on the average, than persons insured by commercial insurance companies that serve the general public. Um, that is a quote from my first paper, but in the paper I was quoting a letter that I received, a sales letter, from the Thai Craft Company, which is the company that does U.S. Uh, academics insurance. And, of course, it wouldn't be true to say that if I own a Thai, Thai life insurance, I'll live longer, but it is true that persons insured by Thai do enjoy longer lives because uh, professors tend to live longer than the population at large. Okay, so um, their idea was that um, there's a correlation uh, between uh, having a Thai life insurance policy and living longer, but buying a, such a life insurance policy is not an effective strategy for living longer. And that's what worried me, because at the time, um, decision theories decision theories about what will happen were I to act in certain ways, commonly use the conditional probability as a measure of what's the probability that if I were to act, I'd get the result I expect. And the conditional probability simply is uh, a correlation, uh, and it doesn't reflect a, a, a causal connection. So the thing we came learn to say was the conditional probability is not the same as the probability of a counterfactual or subjunctive conditional. So P of R given A is just a correlation. Um, it's true that uh, the probability of longer life given you have a tie cref insurance is high, um, but for an effective strategy for living longer, you should do something that's connected not just probabilistically uh, with uh, the result, but you should do something connected by causal law. That was my claim. Um, okay, so yesterday, uh, I told you about my despair that um, causal laws, I realized quite late <laughs> in life, uh, that causal laws do not, after all, provide effective strategies because they're fragile, they're easy to break when one uses them. Um, I uh, wind up, when I, my great sadness as a child was I loved those little toy soldiers and other uh, mechanical devices and uh, if, you, if, if you wind them up that causes them to, to march or to walk or to fall off the end of the table um, but not if you wind them too tightly and the very act of manipulating them in order to achieve the desired result is very likely to break the mechanism that allows the causal principle to be true in the first place. So causal laws are fragile, as I've known ever since I was a very young child. Okay. And they're also local, as I've illustrated, uh, in particular with this recurring example of Bangladesh and Tamil Nadu and the Integrated Nutrition Program. Uh, but there are millions of examples. Okay. Um, now, the other thing that I argued yesterday is that invariance is no rescue that uh, a lot of contemporary philosophers are very keen on invariance. Uh, they won't call something uh, that otherwise passes all the tests for a causal law, um, a causal law unless it's what I say is tempered, like tempered steel, so it doesn't break. Um, uh, so they, they, they take whatever I would take to be reasonable criteria for causal, for causal law, and then they add on uh, invariance, but I think invariance is no rescue because um, causal laws aren't especially invariant. 
Um, and if you just refuse to call things a causal law unless they are, it won't hook up with methodology correctly. And moreover, you need another name for the stuff that I call causal laws, which are the kinds of things that our methods are pretty good at finding our methods that we teach in method. You know, I teach in the London School of Economics and Political Science. And there's the Methodology Institute that teaches every PhD student in LSE methodology. And if you go and watch that they teach, what they teach for how to do uh, methods for causal inference, right? they're the kind of methods I've been talking about, which are geared to establish what I call causal laws. So anyway, I don't think causal laws are in invariant. Okay? And if invariance is added on, you don't need causal laws. After all, if you have principles invariant under the manipulations you're going to, um, to make, then it makes accurate predictions. It doesn't matter whether it's a causal law or not. Okay? So that was yesterday. Today, <laughs> um, what I want to do is to urge that something I call nomological machines are a prime source of invariant causal laws. Okay? Uh, but coming full circle to the concerns I've had all along um, uh, about, for instance, how evidence-based policy is conducted nowadays, um, different machines will imply different causal laws. Uh, so that you have to beware when you're trying to extrapolate from what you've seen uh, a causal law you've established in one place to another because you're very likely actually to be moving from a causal law that's generated by one machine over to a situation that mo should be modeled by a different machine. Okay. That's the story. So RCTs, beware. Okay, causes and strategies. I don't know if this is maybe no joke for people who I mean, I have both a British and an American passport. <laughs> and this is the special connection between Churchill and Roosevelt. So uh, wh where is the special connection? OK, well, my, what I want to say is let's not ask where is this special connection at, but uh, when, uh, when is there a special connection between causes and strategies? And um, that's what I want to argue, is that there is a special connection when, and Maybe uh, Ingvar is uh, going to be a little more cautious about this than I am. Maybe only when there's uh, a nomological machine. Um, but there may be some causal laws that are just causal law simpliciter. They don't need nomological machines to give rise to them, and they don't need nomological machines to ensure their invariance. But most of the ones that I see people using um, are generated by nomological machines. Okay. So the causal laws that support no, I'm reading from this. I'm sorry. I'm supposed not to do that, but uh, <laughs> this is the thesis. The causal laws that support our day-to-day -day strategies are the temporal, or generally, or for the most part, or often enough that you should pay attention, uh, are the temporally asymmetric, conditionally stable input-output relations arising from the successful operation of a nomological machine. Okay. Well, what's a nomological machine? Uh, this is not. Uh, isn't going to provide you an independent way to identify it. It just tells you what it is, and it's going to circular that my claim is true of it because a nomological machine is a stable enough arrangement uh, of components whose features acting in consort give rise to stable input-output relations. That's all a nomological machine is, but a nomological machine has, for the most part, uh, will be made up of components, and the components have what I argued for yesterday at the end of the hour is capacities. They have capacities to make certain contributions, and in the machine arrangement, the com contributions combine uh, to give rise to uh, the output. Okay. So long as that's, of course, uh, depends on the machine running properly, and if the machine runs properly, then the causal laws it generates are stable or invariant, and they depend on the, the machine staying intact and running. Um, and running. Okay. So example, uh, this is one I try to make use of almost every day. Uh, dropping a piece of bread and pushing the lever causes a piece of nicely brown toast in that machine. Okay. So um, this sequence has the earmarks of a causal law. Okay. Um, and it's invariant. I mean, I, if, if this isn't a causal sequence, I don't know what is. I put the toast in, and it causes 
uh, and I put the bread in and it causes, it's part of the cause, right, of a nicely brown piece of toast uh, two and a half minutes later. Um, and it'll pass any number of RCTs or any of the other methods that they recommend you use. Um, and it will moreover pass a physics experiment. So I think <laughs> this is, a, this is, a, this is a, a, a good causal law. And it's invariant. So long as we push the lever on the toaster and not the lever on the floor of my car, which makes the car go faster. Okay. Uh, the toaster, and it's invariant so long as the toaster is intact. Um, and intact means in, in, indeed also being plugged into the wall uh, and having the, uh, in Britain, the electricity needs to be turned on and off at the wall. So uh, when, I, when I give this kind of talk in, uh, in, uh, to, to visitors, I always have to remind them that the, uh, being intact is, goes all the way through to being plugged into the mains and having switch on. Okay. So the sequence uh, not only has the earmarks of a causal law, it is a causal law. Um, uh, and it's invariant, and it provides an effective strategy. Um, pushing that lever on that machine is a really, really good way to get a piece of uh, brown toast. So the causal law is, uh, but the causal law is local. As I said, it's local to that machine. Pushing the lever um, elsewhere, pushing the lever uh, on the playground will um, raise children at the other end of the seesaw. It won't produce you a piece of toast. Um, so this causal law is local to and guaranteed by the toaster. It's because of the structure of the toaster that um, the causal law obtains. And um, okay. So here's another machine that we're all familiar with. And it gives rise to this other causal law that I've been alluding to, that if you step on the lever on the floor of my car or the floor of your car, uh, the, uh, uh, that causes the car to accelerate. And again, the, um, it's, uh, it's a causal principle that's invariant so long as the structure of the car is intact. Um, and there are some other causes. It's like plugging the thing in. You might think that plugging in the toaster in is um, one of the helping factors. And here you might think having petrol in the engine is one of the helping factors. Um, but at any rate, having all the helping factors in place including stepping on the throttle, uh, causes the car to go faster. And it's this machine right, that, um, that does that for you. Okay. Here's another one, naturally occurring machine, not one we built, a uh, nasturtium seed. And if you take the nasturtium seeds, helping factors that I talked about yesterday, uh, you add water, air, warmth, and light, you get nasturtium seedlings. Okay, that's a causal principle. Nasturtium seeds plus water, air, warmth, and light at the right timing causes seedlings to, to germinate and start to grow. Um, so, and that, um, that's guaranteed by the structure of the nasturtium seed. And it's going to be true so long as the, um, the structure is intact. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, here's a question that's worried me uh, for a long time and that I've ducked. Uh, I always say things like the uh, machines give rise to causal laws. Uh, they generate them. Uh, the causal laws depend on them. Uh, but what kind of a relationship is this? Okay. That relationship is causal. And on my account, at least, and you might have a different account, um, it means that it, 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 the causal law that describes that is really talking about singular causal happenings. That, um, you know, if you water these nasturtium seeds, seedlings will, that will cause seedlings. If you water those nasturtium seeds, these will cause seedlings. Um, that uh, regularly, uh, if nasturtium seeds are watered, that causes seedlings. Um, so I'm not so worried about that. But what's this relationship? It's not causal. I mean, it's just not the kind of thing that can figure in a cause. Now, um, when I've talked about problems of um, fragility of causal laws, um, some of my colleagues um, get really cross. And it's mostly the Bayes Nets colleagues. So there's Clark Gleamore and his group. And um, they um, think that, uh, and Judea Pearl, and they really don't want to hear about anything you have to use uh, other than uh, Bayes Nets methods. And Bayes Nets methods 
uh, really are very sophisticated ways of causal base nets methods are very sophisticated ways of making use of probabilities to infer causes um, on the assumption, of course, that uh, I mentioned yesterday that every time you get some kind of a regularity, it has to have some kind of a causal explanation. Um, but they don't like the fact that um, I say, well, you know, you, um, exactly the same problem with Bayes' nets methods that you have with RCTs. Uh, when I'm talking to RCT people, I say, how come you don't use Bayes' methods? But when I talk to Bayes' nets people, <laughs> I say, you know, both you and the RCT guys have a problem of um, your laws being local. And uh, you're doing a great job at establishing it works somewhere, um, but you, you, you must act as if by doing that you've established it's going to work here. Um, here, there, or everywhere, that this is uh, universal. They don't like that, so they say, what's happened is your equations are misspecified. Right? So the equation that <laughs> has a variable for the seeds uh, for the seeds, the water, the air, the warmth, the, for the water, the air, the warmth, the light, and the seeds. Um, and you know, has a variable over here representing um, whether there are seedlings or not. Um, that equation really should have another variable in it uh, that talks about the structure of the nasturtium seed. You know, so you just kind of up <laughs> this into the antecedent of the causal law. Now that I just think is is uh, again, since I've got a view about causal, causal laws, I think that's crazy because you now have something in your causal law that won't, you can't attack by any of the methods we use for testing and establishing causal laws in the natural and social sciences. Um, it's uh, among, uh, among other things. You know, these guys all talk about probabilities and they have to be dealing with um, a variable set over which they put a probability measure. And there is no probability measure about what the probability of there being this kind of, that kind of machine or that, this kind of machine or this kind of machine. There are in a dense infinity along a dense infinity of dimensions of machines possible in the world and this just makes no sense about having a probability measure over them. Um, and moreover, the relationships between the machine and the outcome are just different from the relationships between the um, you know, putting the bread in or stepping on the throttle or uh, the water, uh, air and warmth. And uh, for instance, you know, if you if you, you, can't use you can't use any of those probabilistic methods, uh, you don't do mark method, there's no transfer of energy or whatever you think the transferred quantity might be if you've got a process theory of causality. So it's just a bad idea to try and think of this as a causal relation. Um, so what then? Well, I, always, I said I always just ducked it, but I've been working with a colleague um, who has a simple answer because uh, he's been reading the other so-called mechanists, uh, um, both uh, my colleague uh, Bill Bechtel and Mackimer, Darden, and Craver, MDC as they're called, and they have a view of mechanisms as being structures, the way, as I do, but they're not so worried about uh, causal laws and, and stability as I am, what they're very keen about is getting activities into the world. And uh, what they have is a view in which the, the machine itself goes through a sequence, if the machine itself engages in activities and goes through a series of states and ends up in a final state. So my colleague John Pemberton and I have written a paper together, but you know, all that's interesting in the paper to me is his idea that uh, he, uh, he's solved uh, my problem, I think, okay, because um, this is how he puts it. Um, so what happens in the machine is that you have a change process. Okay, you've got the original arrangement, and then the start arrangement um, is, uh, it either just starts of its own or it's triggered, uh, or you put in an outside, external, and a, as we say, exogenous input, like the bread, uh, and push the lever. So I'm an exogenous input and push the lever. Uh, so <laughs> you start the machine, the machine starts somehow, and the um, various capacities uh, that the features of the machine bear um, produce their contributions, which 
in the uh, arrangement of the machine uh, combine and give you an end arrangement. So um, the machine arrangement provides a context in which the capacities of all the parts exercise. Okay. Um, it begins in the start arrangement, and then each capacity produces its canonical contribution. The contributions combine, and overall, ov the overall change is a combination of the contributions in this context. It's what he calls a change process. Uh, that's not now very surprising. So there we are. Is the ch um, okay? So when the capacities exercise, arrangements change into new arrangements, and that's what's going on. Okay. So here's he's, here's a number of examples. Uh, you've got a <laughs> simple pendulum start arrangement. The change process is the bob exercises its capacity to attract uh, or be attracted by the earth. The string exercises its capacity to pull the bob towards the pivot and the bob moves around. Okay. So among other things, the arrangement matters. It's not just that you've got a bunch of parts that have capacities and you throw them together in a bag. It does matter a lot about the arrangement and that's another topic that uh, we can go into, um, but it's not the topic for today, but it's an important fact about nomological machines. Um, in, in this case, the contributions made by each of the uh, parts uh, we'll just, we, we can think of in terms of them being component forces and they combine in this case there's a, there's a, a well-known rule of how contributions combine uh, as they add by vector addition and um, we might right, um, if we wanted to do a more realistic example of a real pendulum uh, have uh, a machine that has more detail in it um, and in which you get damping and so forth Here's another one. Okay. Um, and the reason for bringing this in is that, um, I, I just uh, to, to, to make clear to you that the, um, this is a familiar phenomenon. Um, empirical, everyday, everyday empirical learning also uses change processes, like children learn to blow toy boats, toy windmills. They learn to fly kites to recognize washing on the lines, trees being blown around, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a change process story here. Okay. So the wind exercises its capacity to push blowable things. The blowable thing exercises its capacity to catch the wind and move. And together, we've got movement uh, of the blowable thing. So we've got to start from the start arrangement. Um, the capacity is exercised. Um, that's the activity, right? The c capacities exercise. They might do so. They, as I said, they might need triggering. They might not, but they just exercise. The contributions are produced. Um, the contributions, um, the simultaneous occurrence of the contributions in the arrangement they're in constitutes the end arrangement. The, the activity, I mean, you, sorry, the end arrangement. Okay. So the capacity of the wind to push then uh, has a stable contribution here. Okay. And then uh, having learned that, you know, the, child, the child learns that and then can extrapolate and you can use that stable capacity of the wind uh, in other reasonably similar nomological machines to get reasonably similar results. So one of the things we learn is we learn sort of simultaneously about what kinds of things carry what kinds of capacities and also um, you know, what's actually going to happen in certain kind of circumstances because those circumstances are like a nomological machine and they um, repeat. Okay. Another example, I'm not going to go through all of these examples, a toilet cistern. Uh, here you have, uh, I wanted to use the toilet cistern one though because I've been talking about start arrangement and end arrangement, but it's a continuous sequence and you can think of it, you can divide it conceptually into a, a large number of steps um, and we usually do uh, in these mechanical devices uh, according to sort of known uh, rules of culmination. So when the handle is turned, the lever pulls up the lift rod, which opens the outlet valve, which releases water from the cistern, which lowers the ball cock, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You have this change process from start to finish, and it gives rise to the, the ordinary, everyday observed uh, rule that if you push the lever on the toilet, uh, the toilet flushes. Okay. So it's a neatly sequenced exercising of capacities. 
Um, the contributions of each component combine in the machine arrangement to produce the change process in one step after another. Uh, OK, so that, that's a nominological machine. Uh, here's another one uh, that I don't really understand, but uh, John and my colleague, uh, John does, and I have a student, Adam White, who's working on this. They both use this as, uh, a, as an example. So I'm sorry, I've given you an example that I don't understand, but the, you know, it has, a, has the same structure. Just so you, you know, I've got the nasturtium seed, you realize it's not a matter of actually, and the wind, it's not a matter of actually machines like the toilet system that are, the toilet cistern that are made out of uh, what were um, you know, classical machines, levers, pulleys, etc. Now, OK, so then how I th I've answered the question, but let's just summarize. How machines give rise to causal laws is the start arrangement turns step by step into the final arrangement. And the basic singular causings, if you're going to use this approach to thinking about causal laws, then you the basic singular causings would be involve the whole arrangement. Here's what happens. The start arrangement causes the ne There's a continuous evolution, but the start arrangement causes the next one, the next stage, which causes the next stage, which causes the next stage, which causes the end. So you've got a singular causing. And, the, um, so, and then the basic causal laws, uh, these are only basic uh, in the sense that uh, what you, you know, since since what's happening in a causal law is the causal law is a description of uh, what kinds of singular causings happen regularly. Um, the basic causal laws will describe these singular causings. Okay, but then um, we've got a sequence of basic singular causings, and that of course means there'll also be uh, regular uh, sequences among aspects of the arrangements. So things you focus on. Um, and then these get described in further uh, laws. So, I mean, the whole machine is, turn is going through a series of stages, but um, we can focus on some aspects of the start arrangement and some aspects of the uh, end arrangement, and uh, those will be regularly associated um, through this causal process. So um, we can describe those uh, in, um, in causal laws as well. Um, so there's no, these, these further causal laws, uh, they're just, um, they're just another way of describing, <laughs> leaving out a lot of information, the basic causal laws. Okay. Uh, so we focus on aspects uh, when we write down causal laws that we find salient, and especially um, the reliable input-output relations that are good for manipulation and prediction. Uh, I gave examples of really mechanical machines and biological machines. Uh, there are also, but they're, um, they're more, um, what do you call it, um, easily to be intruded on, uh, socioeconomic machines. Um, um, that we do have a, a great number of social regularities uh, that arise from uh, the structures of our society, the socioeconomic cultural structures of our societies. Uh, and it's because of the structure of the society uh, in Tamil Nadu that educating mothers uh, about nutrition and ensuring they have enough, they have supplemental feeding for the children uh, improves childhood nutrition there. And it's a different structure of the society in uh, Bangladesh, and that's why educating the mothers doesn't work in Bangladesh. Uh, now, about socioeconomic machines, just um, the, the, you know, I do uh, study a lot of um, um, economics, and a good number of economic models, particularly the economic models in theory, are simply blueprints for socioeconomic machines. You, um, you build a, a, a model and derive in the model that some uh, causal law obtains. It obtains so long as the kind of structure <laughs> that's described in the model obtains. And then you can, of course, ask, uh, does this structure that obtains in the model look anything like anything in the world uh, so that you could expect the causal law that's uh, described to, uh, to appear? Um, so for instance, uh, the models tend to describe how agents and institutions interact to give rise to these causal laws. Um, Think about Lucas's rational expectations models. I mentioned uh, Robert Lucas, a uh, Chicago school economist who um, is responsible for a lot of the um, 
uh, Republican um, uh, uh, views, uh, or he backed up a lot of Republican views over a number of years. So uh, I, I, it's maybe a bad idea to uh, cite him, but I mean, he had uh, the logical structure is very clear. Um, what uh, Lucas says is that, uh, look, the government should not intervene. Why? Not just you know, because we all should be free, uh, <laughs> but because um, the government doesn't know enough to intervene. The government, when it intervenes, has got to rely on some uh, established causal laws. And they, you know, what do they do? They look around and they look to see what causal laws you can establish using our ordinary methodology. And you find a bunch of them. Uh, but what happens is that when the government uh, wants to manipulate the cause, right, there's no way for the government to manipulate the cause in those laws without breaking the machine. And so the very law that the, the very causal principle, the very regularity the government's depending on, right, uh, to predict the outcomes of its manipulations, no longer true when it manipulates. So that's his story. And uh, he defends this by producing a number of rational expectations models for some of the principles governments have relied on um, for manipulation. Um, and a rational expectations model talks about, um, sorry, there should be uh, an apostrophe in the agents. Uh, but the underlying structure is one in which he describes agents' tastes and technology and exogenous shocks. Exogenous in this case means they're shocks that the agents can't predict. Um, and given the, uh, his, uh, the assumptions he makes about agents, um, how they act, given their uh, preferences, uh, the technology and these exogenous shocks. Basically, they act so as to maximize their expected utility. Uh, given this assumption, uh, he derives, um, for instance, a Phillips curve. Okay? And the Phillips curve is the standard curve, uh, standard line that gives a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. Um, and there was a long period when uh, observational data supported uh, the Phillips curve. And, um, and that governments did try to use inflation as a lever for manipulating unemployment, for improving unemployment generally. Um, and that's a good idea because what you can do from this rational, I mean, sorry, it's a good idea. <laughs> it sounds like a good idea because what you can do, if you don't, if you, if you just look, if you just look at what I've said so far, is he really does have a rational expectations model in which he derives that the Phillips curve holds as a causal principle. I mean, he wouldn't say a causal principle, but I say that. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but what happens is that uh, in the model, it really depends that these are exogenous shocks, that these are not predictable. And the claim is that in, um, as soon as uh, the government's going to manipulate inflation uh, to control unemployment, um, the, um, the changes in inflation are predictable and they're recognized by these hugely intelligent agents as <laughs> the price rise they're seeing is not being a price rise, so they're going to get more for their products, but just inflation. And then they act differently and the Phillips curve breaks down. So that's the story. Okay. So <laughs> rational expectations model is one of these blueprints for a socio socioeconomic machine. And um, you know, it's, it's supposed to be a real story. OK. Now, why should you believe in, socio in socioeconomic and nomological machines, apart from that I've just told you a really plausible philosophical story, uh, and uh, given a lot of, I hope, examples to, <laughs> to win you over? Um, well, one thing is because science is actually concerned with them. So look here. Here are some of the core activities of science. Once you begin to think of the core activities in terms of nomological machines, um, they, uh, 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 a great deal of science is devoted to identifying arrangements. Uh, in, so you identify arrangements like identify nasturtium seeds, right? so you can predict the lo local future. Identify the planetary system and its structure, or the neuron, 
which is what I said I didn't understand, uh, how you identify the structure and the arrangement in the neuron in order to make local predictions. But I do understand how, uh, by understanding the structure of the cistern, uh, I can predict that the toilet will flush. Okay. So we identify, we put a lot of work in science into identifying and understanding uh, arrangements of what turn out to be arrangements of no, what I would call nomological machines. Uh, we put a lot of effort in science and technology and in social engineering, uh, though probably not enough in social engineering, into constructing arrangements. Okay? That's in order to control the local future. Uh, we do that when we want to test theories, as in laboratory experiments, uh, but we also do it, as we've seen, in everyday machines all the time, in uh, toasters, cisterns, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we put a lot of effort into learning how you can intervene on arrangements in order to amend the uh, local future. Uh, for instance, we fertilize crops uh, or we genetically modify those nasturtium seeds. And we model. <laughs> a lot of the effort in science is in modeling uh, the arrangements in order to predict and understand the causal laws and understand where they're invariant. You know, so we model the planetary system. Uh, Lucas models the, uh, the economy under certain uh, 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 idealizing assumptions and so forth. So I think these are all very familiar activities of science that uh, get you know, quite readily cast uh, as have, you know, ha having to do with nomological machines and they don't, it's hard to make sense of what people are actually doing uh, if, if you don't think that there are any such things. Um, we spend a lot of effort developing knowledge of capacities. Um, one of the things that's really important uh, that I mentioned uh, yesterday, particularly with Anna Sophia, I stressed it again, is that we learn markers for capacities. So we can independently identify whether something has a mass, and once we know it has a mass, we know it has the capacity to pull other objects towards it. Um, we can independently identify whether something's got a charge, and then we know that it has the capacity, uh, if it's negative, to um, attract uh, other, uh, to attract positive charges and repel negative charges. Um, you independently identify, um, well, maybe I shouldn't give any social examples because they're all, um, they're all suspect uh, about uh, what carries capacities. Okay, so we identify markers for capacities, and that's a large part of what I think science is doing. Um, we work hard to identify the contributions of capacities and how contributions combine in various arrangements. Um, that's what engineers do when they build new devices. It's what laser engineers did when they um, uh, built lasers, is that uh, there were some uh, capacities that were um, known from abstract quantum theory from the time of Einstein's A and B coefficients that if you get something into uh, an inverted state you get more atoms in the excited state than uh, in the de-excited state uh, you can get spontaneous emission uh, but that wasn't enough because they had to learn about the capacities of certain materials and certain newly developed kinds of mirrors in order to actually uh, make an arrangement uh, in which they could control the local future and get laser light. Okay. Um, uh, contributions of capacities, one of the things uh, I studied in early uh, electric theory is um, how various components, capacitors, inductors, resistors, how their contributions combine in a circuit. That's, you know, that's a sort of simple thing uh, you learn. Um, Okay. And you also, I don't have in the list here, but you also spend a lot of time deciding whether something, a cause, is operating only locally or whether it really has a capacity, and if, and if so, what it is. Um, and then we um, do characterize collections of things in the world as known nomological machines. Okay. So um, that's the f uh, one, th one whole set of activities that we do in science that um, make sense if and I think more or less only if you uh, think that we're dealing with n nomological machines um, as sources of invariant causal laws. Um, another thing that, um, another aspect of science that I think really matters that nomological machines make sense of is um, although I've stressed um, so far a lot of 
of different, I've stressed so far a lot of different methods for establishing or testing causal laws. Uh, the ones that use probabilities are really what I would call that evidence. They're showing that there's a causal law there. Uh, that there are certain singular causal happenings happening. You know they're there because there's a difference when the cause is there that isn't there when the uh, cause isn't there. There's a difference in the effect and nothing else explains it. So you, there's got to be a causal relation. That's that evidence. It's just evidence that there's a causal principle. Um, but we're not hap happy. Uh, I think uh, I mean, these new RCT guys sometimes act as if they are, but in general, um, there's, we get a, a, a variety of different kinds of evidence about um, causal laws and principles. Uh, we gather what, how, and that evidence. So um, science makes use of what evidence, uh, which involves um, capacities and the arrangements that can give rise to change. Um, how evidence, which is we describe the how the cause evolves into the effect and that evidence which is the regularities or uh, your direct evidence that the regularities and causal principles obtain. So the what evidence um, is evidence about the underlying structures that give rise to causal laws. Uh, we're very happy with um, Kepler's laws for planetary motion because not only um, you know, are they very well, do we have a lot of that evidence by d doing observations uh, of these elliptical orbits over and over again, but we can actually produce what evidence, what it is that produces those elliptical orbits or generates them or gives rise to them is the arrangements in the planetary system and the capacities of the mass of objects to attract each other. So we, 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 we do an awful lot of work on what evidence. How evidence is the unfolding of the causal process and in general, it's not just enough that you have, a, I mean, it, it's not enough to really assure you I think you've got a causal law. Um, the, just to see that you think uh, there's sufficient, that you know, whenever the cause ha uh, is changed, the effect will change caterus paribus. Um, you'd like to be able to see what's the continuous, the sequence of continuous changes that get you from there to here. That's what you do in the Mark method, and it's what you do in process tracing, which is very common in biology. Okay. And then there's the obvious that evidence. So I think the focus on nomological machines also accounts for and makes sense of the use of these three kinds of evidence, why all three kinds of evidence are good kinds of evidence for the truth of a causal law claim. Okay, so that's um, sort of to argue that uh, science does deal in nomological machines, even though, of course, scientists don't use those terms. Um, now, we started out talking about strategies. So I want to uh, review why nomological machines are so useful for strategy. Uh, because you should be a bit wary. Um, remember la yesterday uh, I told you about capacities. And I said, well, capacities um, will invariantly make their contributions. Um, th maybe there aren't any capacities in nature, but insofar as they are, they're going to make their contributions uh, if they're not interfered with, uh, because that's what it is to be a capacity. Right? Um, now, maybe there aren't any, uh, any capacities, but uh, I reminded you of the scholastics right, who made fun of uh, the Aristotelians, the Aristotelians who, like me, believed in capacities <laughs> um, by uh, you know, um, what makes heavy bodies fall, well, gravity. Uh, what's gravity? It's that which makes heavy bodies fall. Um, well, gravity is the very thing that has the capacity to make heavy bodies fall. Um, but if you can't independently identify it, it's no use to you that there's that capacity in nature. Happily, in science, we uh, have learned that that capacity uh, universally comes along with the feature of having, uh, having a gravitational mass. Okay. Um, so it took an additional argument to say that capacities, um, I mean, it's not just enough that they provide for invariances. <laughs> it's not enough to make them useful to us. Right? We, have, we have to have somehow <laughs> know <laughs> when they're there. And same thing with nomological machines. So um, the nice thing about nomological machines like capacities, I mean, God was good to us and provided uh, at least a lot of the capacities um, with markers 
and markers we can have come to learn about and markers we can recognize. So for a nomological machine, we can uh, come to recognize the machines. And we can recognize them via labels. Right? So my toaster comes with a label on it in case I'm an idiot that says this is a toaster, not a car. Right? <laughs> uh, don't step on the lever and expect, uh, expect to accelerate. Um, so we've got labels on the ones we build. And my nasturtium seed package has, um, there's no label on the seeds, but there's a label on the package that says, these are nasturtium seeds. Right? So I know what, the, what they, uh, they come with labels. Um, or there are other visible or measurable signs. Um, there needn't be. Right? But you know, experts can look at a nasturtium seed, and they can tell it from a sweet pea seed or a tomato seed, or uh, because there are external visible signs uh, that tell you um, that you know, th this this seed has the right structure inside that when you plant it, you'll get a tomato seedling, and this seed has a quite different structure inside that when you plant it, you'll get a nasturtium seedling, and other people you know can tell the difference by looking. Um, so we can learn to recognize the, the machine and what it is by labels and just by visible signs. Uh, we can come to learn and recognize the canonical input-output relations from that machine via the manual that comes with it. <laughs> uh, push the lever. <laughs> Don't expect to just put the bread in. Push the lever, and then you'll get the toast, um, or more complicated manuals. Um, okay. Uh, trial and error, scientific study, uh, and we also learn what endangers stable operation. And you learn them in the same way. The manual says, uh, don't immerse this in water, um, uh, don't let it get too cold, don't let it get too hot. Um, the, uh, you learn about nasturtium seeds that you shouldn't store them at, uh, in, in temperatures that are too hot or too cold, um, et cetera. Okay. Um, and we learn that what endangers the stable operation, there, um, and there are very often markers by which we recognize damage. So um, you, I mean, not only can experts sometimes tell, they can't always tell if the nasturtium seed's been um, stored at too high or too low temperature, but they can tell if I've smashed it with my hammer. Right? So um, here are some examples <laughs> where uh, you can tell by looking. Uh, there are markers for damage. So here's a nomological machine, and you know it's damaged. There's another one, right? Uh, so uh, let's return then to further reasons why nomological machines are so useful for strategy. Um, that, that all had to do with really recognizing the machines, recognizing when they're intact, recognizing when they're damaged. Uh, now, the other thing that, if they're going to be useful to us, is we don't just recognize that the machine is there and intact, but that uh, we can, uh, for many, many of them, we recognize the nature of the inputs that will give rise to the kind of outputs we're interested in. Um, because for the nomological machines that supply strategies we actually use, okay, um, the input causes are ones we can or can learn how to manipulate. So I can manipulate um, the giving water, air, warmth to the seeds in order to get the seeds to uh, uh, that whole complex to produce um, uh, se nasturtium seedlings. Um, I can um, I learn that the vending machine I've got to put a pound coin in if I want to get out a bag of crisps. I've got to put the pound coin in actually and push the buttons B1. And then I get crisps, and if I push the button B2, I get a chocolate bar that I want. Okay. Um, and um, we, we learn about inputs. I mean, if we're going to actually be able to use these, um, we've got to be able to find inputs that we recognize, that we know how to, uh, that we know how to manipulate, and moreover, that we can manipulate uh, without breaking the machine, unlike Lucas's view about the economy can't manipulate the economy without breaking it. Um, but uh, for mo the machines where uh, I think that we uh, have causal laws that provide us with strategies, uh, we are able to manipulate them without breaking the machine. So I don't want to say that you know, all normal, I mean, there's no claim here at all that all nomological machines uh, have 
inputs that we can manipulate without breaking the machine. It's just rather that, there ha that again, God has been good to us, also we will create a lot on our own, um, that uh, have this characteristic that we can recognize them, we can recognize when they're not damaged, we can recognize what to do not to damage them, and uh, we recognize what inputs we can do that will produce the outputs without breaking the machine. And some of those inputs are actually ones we want to do because those are the outputs we want to get. So, um, okay. So the, 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 the conclusion is that we rely on causal laws. We often generally, I think for the most part, um, for strategies rely on, gener on causal laws that are generated by nomological machines to produce predictable results. Uh, we do this because they're stable, these laws, relative to the su successful operation of the machine, and that we can learn to recognize these machines and what it takes to obtain an effective strategy from them. Caution. Okay. The causal laws, <laughs> if I'm right that, that the causal laws we rely on are generated by nomological machines, that means there's a good chance they don't travel well. Right? The causal law that holds here won't hold there. The one that holds for the toaster won't hold for the, uh, uh, if I st uh, step on the, the lever on the floor of my car. Um, if I educate mothers in Tamil Nadu, it doesn't work in, um, that causal law doesn't work in Bangladesh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then RCTs, remember what RCTs do, they give evidence about causal laws, so they're not a very powerful tool for predicting what happens in new settings. Okay. Now I don't want to, um, so I'm just coming full circle now to how I got started being worried about the, uh, the heavy emphasis almost exclusively on RCTs in um, evidence-based policy increasingly widely, and we talked yesterday about development economics. Uh, they're fine, they establish, they're really good at establishing uh, it works somewhere, uh, but, um, and I don't mean to say that we can't learn that what works somewhere works elsewhere, and it's just that uh, we are now um, enjoined to focus over here, and we're not, um, we're not doing anything to discover the underlying nomological machines that uh, would um, will allow us to bet uh, that it works over here. So I'm going to close with some good news, <laughs> just one second of good news. Okay. Um, nomological machines give rise to invariant causal laws, and we've built a lot of nomological machines. Right? So um, you can, if you've got an invariant causal law, and here's the sort of standard trivial idea, you can jiggle the end of an invariant causal law to make changes at the other end, but you're kind of stuck with <laughs> the outputs that are guaranteed by the inputs you can jiggle for that causal law. So if you want serious change, you can build new machines with new causal laws, and you can get a lot of really good builders uh, to build them for you. Thank you. Yes, if I remember correctly, I think in your book, um, The Dapple World, you defended the view that macroscopic world can't be reduced to, or it's not even supervenient on the micro world. So when you said God had created the micro world, he had also to, to create the macroscopic world. Well, he had, to con he had to construct capacities for things in the ma macroscopic world, yeah. So, and then your talk about nomological machines seems to be in tension, uh, be in tension with that view, because Speak of components when combined, giving rise to irregularities. So my question is really, why isn't that a, a tension between these views? Uh, because uh, you, when I did the toilet cistern, I didn't mention anything about string theory or quantum theory or um, electrons and positrons. I talked about uh, rods and levers and pulleys and chains um, and um, <laughs> uh, so some of the, um, uh, sometimes uh, one does, um, I, mean, I don't want to deny that you ever uh, have um, reductions, uh, I, I think they're few and far between, um, but usually uh, when you're talking about, when you do these machines, the components that have the capacities um, are more or less all at the kind of same level uh, if you had believed in levels at the same level as the, um, as the 
as the machine as itself, itself, although they are proper parts they're of it. Parts, yeah. okay. um, you, um, it doesn't, <laughs> no, <laughs> the, uh, knowing the behavior of the electrons, knowing everything about behavior of electrons, uh, if you knew nothing about um, any of the capacities of macroscopic objects, says me in the dappled world, right, you wouldn't be able to uh, predict the outputs of the normal of, of the toilet cistern. Uh, I mean, you know, that's a radical view. I didn't argue for it here because, you know, <laughs> you, can, you can buy all this, right, <laughs> without having to uh, take on board my uh, really st strong views about there's never any cases I've seen. Uh, there's all just promissory notes, right? We can all do all this with fundamental physics, and you can't do anything with fundamental physics. Uh, the people who say that never, never actually look at or show you how you, um, the models <laughs> that produce predictions about, um, say, laser light, right? uh, where you put in, in, you always put in information about the capacities of macroscopic objects, you put in Newtonian capacities, etc. And then, you know, everyone says, oh, that's only for a shortcut. You know, if only we did it properly, <laughs> we wouldn't have to do that. And, I, you know, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'll believe but, it when I see it. Yeah, so, but couldn't you have the same line of reasoning regarding the molecule or atoms in relation to their parts and that they combine into machines? And so you have some kind of reductionism or Convenience. Yeah. Um, so one of the. Oh, sorry. Yes. Exactly. And um, I didn't take it out for that reason. I just. Uh, John has a, a slide, uh, on, uh, making water out of hydrogen and oxygen, uh, and he thinks that's a nomological machine, uh, that, um, I'm not sure it is. That's the reason I left it out. I mean, I didn't leave it out because it might argue against the reductive view in the dappled world. It's that. I don't understand how that works um, much more than I don't understand how um, the neuron works. Uh, I don't understand how that works because I don't quite see, just like John Stuart Mill, I don't quite see how I get the qualities of the water out of the, um, capacity, the capacities of the water, uh, uh, hydrogen and oxygen, in the particular combination they have. So John's so this is part of the reason for stressing arrangement. So John thinks that you can get the capacities out of, you can, there's something about the capacities in that arrangement that allows you know, the, that machine to go through that process that ends with all those characteristics of water. And um, so if you, I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm just speculating, right? So <laughs> my, my co-author, he thinks that's a case where there's a sense in which you can do a reduction. Um, the problem about the reduction is that not, it's really clear the arrangement matters, and we don't know how, I don't know how to think about arrangements yet, um, you know, because it's not a reduction if, if it doesn't come out from below. I mean, if the arrangement is something you have to put in at quite a different level, then... Okay. Uh, I'm very much in uh, uh, all the four lectures I like. I think I'm very much in agreement with what you uh, You could have like said. them and disagree with every word, of course. Sorry? You could like them and still disagree with every yeah. word. But now comes a question and then a, a kind of further thought. We're about the same age. I have followed your writings uh, more or less over the decades. And what, from the start, one thing I did not approve of, disagreed widely because for some reasons, no need to talk about here, they were important to me. And that is that in your book, uh, How the Laws of Physics Lie, you very explicitly claim that uh, in vector addition, it's only the resultant vector that we should regard as real. The rest is mere uh, help for thinking. Now, here on your slide with the pendulum, Newtonian mechanics came in. And there you said the contributions are, are added real. via vector addition. and you at least to me, spoke as if each and every contribution was as real as anything can be. So 
simple question, have you changed your mind? I would be very happy about that. Or, or how, do you other, how do you explain the consistency between your yes. slide here today about the pendulum and uh, uh, I guess it was your first book, was it? How the Laws of Physics Lie? Yeah, okay. Given it, 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 it was, what, 1970 yeah, yeah, yeah. something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 1979? Yeah. It was my first book. Yeah. I'm not, we're not that old. <laughs> um, uh, I've changed my mind. Or oh. what I've done, um, I've changed my mind. I think that's the thing to say. Um, but I can also uh, kind of explain what was going on uh, is that, and I think you see this in other people, um, I accused Rausch of something which is structurally the same. I said she wants to do an objective theory, but we're so in the habit of having subjective theories of evidence and object that, you know, I think she's just without, without, without realizing it imported the things from the views that she really doesn't want. Yeah. And I think that's what I, that's what I was doing in How the Laws of Physics Lie. Um, I was um, not uh, sufficiently, I, even though I did causality, I mean, it was bad enough to do causality. Now, if you listen to me, there's all these different modalities out there in the world. There's singular causings, there's causal laws, there's statements of capacity, there are all different kinds of modalities. Well, I didn't, I mean, first I don't, okay. I, didn't well, yeah. with, I didn't, I didn't realize that. that. <coughs> uh, I certainly didn't, it wasn't like it was in the back of my head, but it just wouldn't have, I mean, I just wasn't imaginative enough to think that. Um, so I was using John Ehrman, David Lewis kind of standard of occurrence. And what seemed to me was that you couldn't have the components occur and the whole thing occur in the same sense of occurrence that those humans wanted. Um, I, I mean, you see it, but I was just explaining it that since we raised the question, uh, everyone else. Um, you could think a wall and the bricks that make it up all occur in the same sense of occur. Uh, but I don't think that component forces and the total force can. Um, then, you know, people think they can. I think that's just concealing that they're talking about contributions and capacities. Uh, so I now use lots of other examples, like the circuits, where there's just no way in which you can think you learn the contributions of the resistors, the capacitors, the inductors, and you don't add them up in any way to get the, the um, the current, uh, the total current, you use some other rule of combination that would never occur to you to make you think that all those little components are, are really just there, you know, the way the bricks are in the wall, as well as the total current. Yeah, but I, I thought about mechanisms, and I think if I had known your uh, term, nomological machines, I would, in a paper I wrote 15 years ago, have uh, used the term logical machines, ah. and the idea is extremely simple, therefore I can't resist putting <laughs> it forward here. Think of two cogwheels. They have to move in opposite directions, and to me this truth is as obvious and as epistemologically certain that the, uh, some of the angles in a triangle is 180 degrees. They have to move in different yeah. directions. From this you can say or think if you put a third cogwheel onto both of them, this third cogwheel have to go opposite to both of them. That means it has to move in two directions at once, which <laughs> is logically impossible. Therefore, three cogwheels combined can not move. And that, w I think this kind of, so to speak, logical thinking plays an important role in engineering thinking when you construct arrangement to think one of the phrases. So I, I think there is very much to do with your notion of a nomological machine that has not been done. That's, so to speak, the simple point of this little remark. Yeah. I think you told me that um, at some point, perhaps uh, at this other conference, because I've taken that on board. Uh, it's just that um, I'm reluctant, I'm reluctant to do the work it takes to think it through. Uh, you know, what are the caterers paribus conditions? What are you, um, I mean, you're assuming that a cogwheel has, in a sense, a certain geometrical shape by definition, and um, I think you're right. 
I think it does, and that uh, we claim there are cogwheels in the world, and etc. But no, I agree with you. Now again, this is not so much a question. <laughs> I, I just want to understand a little bit. Maybe it's a continuation of Tobias's uh, line of uh, questioning. So uh, I have a, a question about the inside of these machines. So one question, or one thing I was wondering about is that at times when you were talking about these uh, machines, uh, you described them as mechanisms in the sense, it, I mean, very nice to think of it as you lower a lever and then this happens and then that happens and then this happens and that goes up and that goes down very mechanical, man, mechanically and so almost like a sequence of mini, mini causal transactions you might say and then in the end there is this major cause and then of course I think perhaps what Tobias possibly was after is that then of course you could then in every nominological machine you could like subdivide the, the individuation of machines would be like you have this machine but you might as well uh, slide this machine up and you get these smaller machines which you in turn may slide up because inside every machine you have uh, the seedling for, for, for smaller machines so to speak so that you get further and further down the line but then at times you speak as if what happens when you push the lever of the machine whatever kind of machine it is is that there are these capacities that combine. Now, there, there it sounds as if, you know, all, the, all this talk about, uh, so there it's, uh, it sounds as if what happens inside the machine is much harder to predict or say anything about, in fact, so that you can actually identify machines and you can see that if you push the lever, something happens and then you have this predictable result. You can, so you have something coming in, something coming out, and then something happening in the middle. You cannot really tell what, because it's not this first this, then this. There's, there are all these capacities that are kind of starting to work together, and perhaps there are what we might call emergent effects. I mean, they seem at least harder to quantify, harder to uh, yeah, understand, perhaps. So, Yes. Do you have a comment on this? Yes, uh, I have a comment. Uh, um, if you take the change story, so let's escape and go back to where there's a change story. I don't know whether we need the picture, but or we have one of these change stories that John likes so much. Let's not do that one. That one's, uh, that one's too unstructured. There's that one. Now that one may be too mechanical for us. Um, the, the image that I think uh, is now the right one to have is that the machine starts at a start arrangement and it does go through a sequence of changes. And the sequence of changes um, is um, a series of things you might call machines themselves. So if you, um, if you have, uh, you um, might go, when the handle is turned, the lever, which has the capacity to pull up the rod, pulls up the rod. Well, you could just have a little machine, that, that, that's all it had, right? It had a lever and a rod, <laughs> which is not doing anything interesting, but um, uh, pressing the lever pulls up the rod because the lever is a lever and pressing one end raises objects at the other end. Um, and that, uh, that itself would be a machine with the input-output relations that pressing the lever raises the rod. Uh, but then we, the next step, uh, depending on, um, I mean, it could just depend on the structure that's already there, but normally it depends on there being other components with other capacities, produces the next step. Produces the, so you can slice the machines up like this, temporarily, and have machines all along the way but you can't slice them up by going to their parts. Um, so that's, you know, one thing is to sli slice them temporarily this way. Another is to say that um, every, you know, every input-output relation caused by a machine is um, reducible to its parts all behaving, at a, I mean, the reducible thing is it's reducible to its parts behaving in certain ways, uh, but um, what we're doing at this stage is ascribing irreducible cap capacities to the parts. So um, the, 
the handle uh, is attached to uh, the handle is attached to a lever that's attached to a rod. Okay, those are the three parts. Okay. Those uh, in that arrangement, uh, the I mean the lever always has a capacity to raise an object at the other end when this object is pressed. So these three, when they're hooked together, so that the one is a lever and pushing this is pressing on the end of it and the other, that's simply um, those, the capacity of a lever to raise an object at the other end is it makes its contribution. Right? It <laughs> um, now the reason I would talk about a contribution there is you might actually have something pulling on the other end and you're pressing and it's trying to pull it but it's not doing it because and maybe it breaks for that reason so you need to understand that the contribution is there even though um, you, you're not getting the predicted output so the components uh, have contributions and if you go to the the force one which was where was that the back with the one this one there's the canonical case but I don't think it's really uh, I don't think much of life is like this where you have parts uh, the parts have features like being massive <laughs> uh, the ma those features bring with them capacities capacities to attract and be attracted um, and we have a rule I mean, those capacities, we know, we, not only we know, but it's also a fact that they, um, they um, don't need to be triggered. So they're always, the bob is always attracting and being attracted by the earth. So the only thing you need to do is release the bob. And those capacities produce their contributions. And the contributions are the total force that adds vectorally. Um, I don't think I went down to... Uh, Microphysics to do that. I stayed all at the um, uh, at. Uh, 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 you know, I mean, I would just claim you can't get any of this out of uh, uh, microphysics. So I can slice the machines like this, but to go from one stage to the next, you have to have components with capacities uh, that combine, that produce contributions that combine to give you the the, the end point of the first stage. Okay, so just one small question. So, yeah. Suppose you have this machine, which <coughs> consists in some kind of transfer of energy. Or, I mean, but, you, but what it basically is, is you, you push a lever and something goes up. So how, how would a, a microphysical machine look then? I mean, what, how, how would that kind of machine look on that? Those, there are machines on that level. I don't think there, are any no, okay. lev there aren't any microphysical levels, no, levers. Okay. First of all, okay. <laughs> uh, no, ah. So are there microphysical uh, machines? Uh, yes. Um, so I think that uh, there are um, uh, a... It's not enough, of course, to have a bag of atoms in an excited state, or an atom over here and an atom over there, and an atom, they ha you have to have a collection of atoms in an excited state. But suppose you have this lever and this, thi this happening, you have this machine yeah. inside of the machine, but you don't describe it as a lever, you describe it in terms of excited, at I don't know physics, so excited atoms jumping yeah, back well, and forth. That's, that's, you know. we, that's the question in the dappled world that I didn't discuss about why, what the arguments are that you can't reduce that. The arguments that it, it ain't reduced uh, anywhere. I've never seen a, uh, oh no, sorry, I've seen two or three reductions. Right? All this stuff about how you can reduce just is um, promissory notes. And I can make a, I, I claim I can make a perfectly consistent uh, account of why we have the successes in science that we do without the big metaphysics that says it's all physics from the bottom up. I mean, it just takes, the metaphysics just takes what you see is what you get, and what you use in your models to make accurate predictions is what you suppose. And I have, um, I think I can sit down and tell you what I think the, how to put the fundamental, these fundamental laws with the right caters paribus conditions in so that they, I can explain what the bounds on their domain is. It isn't that they hold in this room and not in that room. It's that they hold um, when all the causes of the relevant effects can be described in the concepts available to the theory. But I mean, still, Eva, you agree that there are things like atoms 
Yeah, yes. sure. So, I mean, so this is more a question about the indiv individuation of machines. So what you're saying is that when you have this machine, uh, which is the toilet system, then at the same place you have another machine, of course, a distinct machine, which is, consists of of these atoms and uh, whatever. Well, I don't know whether I don't know whether I have a machine. I, mean, I do have a machine that consists of atoms. I have the toilet cistern. Uh, whether or not the facts uh, about the atoms that are uh, admissible in microphysics are enough to give you a prediction about the input-output relations of the toilet, that's the question that you know, is is the question of reduction, and I'm happy to <laughs> start now and give another series of lectures, but that's old, that for me, that's old stuff. I mean, that's what I did uh, in this book that Tobias has mentioned, the, the Dappled World. So I just don't think it's the case. Right? When I look at the way you do, uh, um, you actually, you, I believe in quantum theory. I think quantum theory is wonderful. I'm happy to have my eyes operated on with lasers. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think it's absolutely phenomenal. I believe I don't, I don't, I don't, I mean, there's no, I don't understand what it would be to believe in a theory. What I think is it's a fantastic tool for, and particularly in the hands of my friends who are laser engineers, and a fantastic tool in helping us to build lasers. Um, it was really important to understand this thing about uh, spontaneous emission uh, being, will, will stimulate uh, uh, coherent, uh, more coherent radiation. That's something that um, is, kind of a lesson from quantum theory, um, the idea that you can use quantum theory to predict um, the behavior in a laser, that I don't, I don't believe. Um, and when I look at the models for lasers, they're, um, well, the anecdote is, I used to go to these laser engineering courses, and I wanted to study lasers, and I wanted to study them theoretically, because I knew I wasn't any good at experiment and stuff. I wanted to study them theoretically. I still had to go to the, the engineering department at Stanford, and they did teach quantum theory, but they didn't, you know, it just didn't, and it doesn't carry through all the way. So these <coughs> guys say, well, I mean, you know what the arguments are. They, they say, um, we, we um, can't be bothered. <laughs> Why should we? I mean, we're getting what we want, and that's just an exercise. Leave it to some philosopher to, uh, uh, you know, to 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 to, to do the to, to to write out the <laughs> the real reduction. And I don't th <laughs> I don't think anybody.